Good morning. Well, uh, Mr. Johnson is up in the mountains somewhere. He says he doesn't have internet connection. I think he tells me that just so that I won't give, try to get a hold of him. You know. <laughs> uh, well, welcome this morning. A few announcements. Um, one is this parking is an absolute disaster. So what I'm going to try to do is find out if we can talk to the people upstairs. And on Friday, if by 9 o'clock their space is not filled, that we can use them. Because half their people work from home. Why shouldn't we be able to use those? It's a disaster to have to walk clear around the front of the building when they're all empty out front. So don't give up on that. I'm going to see if we can get that done. <laughs> the uh, other thing I wanted to mention is the bathroom issue. Um, many of you, um, if you're like Nancy, and I know other people that Arlene is another example, they, even though they've moved these more elegant potty purpose, whatever they are, uh, <clears throat> you, have a, you have to go up the stairs to get to it. And they haven't been promoting this, but I wanted this group specifically to know there are two bathrooms right there where he's pointing them out for us. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. <laughs> there are two bathrooms right inside there on the left. So they are not promoting this at all within the church for the congregation, but you guys need to know they're up here and available. They're kind of like the two we used to have out here. That are up there, and there you can go in and not have a problem with it. So, just through that door, you can't miss them. They're on the left. Go through that door up front. Okay. Let's see if I had anything else. I'm glad you didn't make any coffee plans. Yeah, it was kind of nice for me. I didn't have to come in early to make coffee, which was nice. They uh, they let us know that they took the uh, coffee machines and uh, unhooked them and put them in storage. So who knows when we'll see those again. No, there won't be any coffee on Sunday. It's, yeah, coffee's gone for a while. So, <clears throat> well, you know, I don't think they realize how much coffee you guys drink. I know. You, re you do two urns of regular coffee and one decaf every Friday morning. I can't believe it. <laughs> and Jason doesn't think anybody drinks coffee. They need to come to this group once to find out what, what it's all about. <clears throat> So anyway, as a reminder, most of you saw it in the, in the uh, notice from D Steve that we do need to bring our own drinks, whether it's water. I'm going to try to see if we can't at least get bottles of water available here as a minimum. I think we can probably do that. But bring your own drink to be on the safe side, if whatever you'd like to drink. That should be the way you do it. Uh, <clears throat> one other point is uh, uh, <clears throat> this Saturday is volunteer work for any of the guys that want to uh, come and do that. I know it was kind of interesting. I came up for a few hours yes, last Saturday, and I would say half the people there were old people like us. They weren't the young guys in there doing it. It was a bunch of old guys doing all the work. But if you, know, if you can get away, even for two or three hours, it would probably be helpful. So uh, uh, <clears throat> if you can do it, that would be fine as well. Are there any other things? There is one person. Lisa, you want to make a comment about Walter? Yeah, well, just a minute. Yeah, get a mic for me. <clears throat> Did you have to get on the last row, Lisa? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so Ruth and Walter Staten, and they usually sit just right by me, usually. Put your um, mic so up next to you. Uh, Walter, so he found out that he has cancer. Um, he's had a couple of CT scans. This has all been since Easter, by the way. So um, they're actually at the hospital as we speak. Um, and they're just praying that the procedures will give them an accurate diagnosis and treatment plan and just, of course, for healing. So thank you. Yeah, Walter and Ruth, my mic's not working either. <laughs> Hmm. Where's Dave? Uh, let me uh, go back and see if I can turn that on. And uh, I tell you what, Fred, why don't you pray for the group and I'll go try to turn his mic on. You can pray for, the, pray for him and I'll try to get it turned on before he gets up. Good, 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time this morning. We pray for Dave as he digs into your word. We pray that you would uh, open our minds and our hearts and the Holy Spirit to help us understand your, your word about you better. And Lord, this morning we pray for Walter, and we pray that you would uh, uh, reveal to those uh, radiologists and all the doctors exactly what's going on with him so they can come up with a, a good treatment plan for him. But ultimately, we pray for your healing touch on him. We know that you are our healer. And we thank you in advance for how you're going to answer this prayer. We pray you'd give him comfort and peace. And we just uh, lift them to you this morning. We thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, am I on? No. Am I on yet? Testing one, two, three. Ichi ni sanchi go. Do it in Japanese. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> French. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, what I want you to do is turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We started in that, but we didn't finish. And so what I wanted to do is to explain something. Remember, this is the story that uh, John is trying to reveal all throughout his gospel something really important, and that is that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God, the only Son of God, and that by believing in him, trusting in him, you could have eternal life. And so John, everything he's doing in this gospel is pushing towards that envelope. And so in chapter 1, he talks about that Jesus Christ, he wanted to prove that he was from the very beginning. He takes a different approach then the other Gospels, remember Matthew and Luke uh, talk about Jesus, but they talk about him from more of an earthly uh, perspective, the genealogies. But John goes right back and he says, in the beginning was the word. And he's talking about Jesus Christ at that particular time. So John's Gospel in chapter 1, he starts putting it that way. Then in chapter 2, what he does is he shows that Jesus Christ has power over nature and so he turns water into wine. Uh, that would put a lot of uh, businesses out today. But uh, anyways, he turns water into wine. In chapter 3, he talks about the uh, high-status Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. And he shows how even the high-status religious leaders of the day needed to understand that Jesus Christ was truly the Son of God. And so we have that very famous verse. John 3.16, all of us know it uh, probably by heart, even if we've never uh, tried to memorize it. You can't help but uh, remember it. Remember, for God so loved, and then remember off of the word love comes that he gave. So we have uh, the gospel in a nutshell in John chapter 3, verse 16. Then in chapter 4, he, not, he goes from a Pharisee, a very religious man who still doesn't understand the things of God, and he goes to a, the lowest class of socialite. Not only is she low on the class of being a, a woman, but because she's a prostitute type of woman, because she's married to uh, five or six husbands. She's got so many of them. And uh, the one she's living with is not even her husband. And Jesus still reaches out to her. So John has that great contrast between the religious leaders that are supposed to be the the presenters of the gospel of God, uh, they need Christ, and so does the, the lowest on the status. Not only is she a woman, but she's a Samaritan. Remember, the Samaritans weren't exactly uh, high appraised within the scriptures. Then in chapter number five, now what he does is he shows his power over healing. And so in chapter number five, if you notice something in the text, and I don't know how your text goes, but You'll notice in chapter 5, the very first verse says, sometime later. Uh, you'll see that in John's gospel. He'll, he'll do something like, look at chapter 6, for instance. Uh, sometime after this. You see how this, these chapters are put apart? And then in chapter number 7, uh, it goes on, basically it says, after this. 
And so what John is doing is he's putting things together in, in segments so that we are able to understand the truth of the gospel. So John chapter 5, though, is really unique, and I wanted to explain that, the healing at Bethesda. Now, Bethesda, in some of your Bibles, you think I'm pronouncing it wrong. There is a spelling. They're having trouble with the spelling of the word on how, what the exact spelling is on the different texts. Some of them have it spelled uh, a little bit different, and it's Beth Zeta. It's Z-A-T-H-A. In fact, I think that's in the Texas Receptus uh, where they have that. But anyways, this pool, they're not even sure where it is exactly, but they did find a spot just north of the uh, uh, temple. And what it is is it's right near St. Anne's Church if you've been there. And you'll find this place where there's steep steps that go down to a pool. Now, at first, they thought there was only one pool. But they found out that when they talks about the five columns, you see that in the text uh, in verse number, uh, let's see, verse number two, where it says it's surrounded by five colored, uh, covered columns. Uh, the word uh, sota, sota uh, is the word that's used in the Greek. It, it, it actually means like there's separation there. There are two pools. Now, let me explain how these pools work. What happens is the water comes down, fills the one pool. They open up a dam. This is how they come up with the five walls. Uh, they open up a dam, and it fills the bottom pool. Now, the bottom pool uh, was quite large uh, when you really think about it. Uh, it's probably 55 feet by 12, so it's a pretty large pool uh, that these people would be sitting around waiting for the waters to move. Now, in our translations, most of the modern translations that you have today, verse number four is missing. Remember that. That's not a, it's not so bad. You don't have to worry about it. But uh, what I want you to know is that in many of the older manuscripts that they found, uh, after the King James was already produced, uh, they found manuscripts that were older to use, and what they found is that verse is not included in there. Now, some of you say, oh my goodness, that's a terrible thing to happen with the scriptures. No, it's not. Uh, think about it. The scribes, what they did is they did like I do in my Bible, and that is you'll be going along in your Bible, and you'll write a note in the, in the, on the side. And what happened is sometimes those notes were included then in the manuscript that would be passed on to the different places that that manuscript would go. So it's really not a problem. It's probably just a scribe that is trying to clarify something uh, in the text. So I, I never worry about that. But what I want you to remember here in this uh, particular uh, text is that Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath and what happens, notice in verse number seven, sir, the invalid reply, or actually Jesus first before uh, tells us that he's been lying there for 38 years. And Jesus says, do you want to get well? And he says, sir, I have no one to help me to get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else gets in there ahead of me. So Jesus says three imperatives. He says, I want you to get up. I want you to pick up your mat and I want you to, to start walking. At this, the man was cured. He gets up by his mat. He walks. And the day that this place took place, and I like the way John puts this, the day this took place was a Sabbath. So what happens, what happens is that the Jews get upset with him healing on the Sabbath. Now, what I want you to understand is that Jesus is not breaking the Sabbath. Remember, I mentioned that last week. He's not breaking the Sabbath by doing what he's doing because that would put Jesus as a sinner. But what happened is the scribes and Pharisees were building laws around the laws. Remember, I talked about it last week. There were 613 laws that they added to build a hedge around the law of Moses. Those laws... Uh, were to keep people so that they, if they broke anything, they broke those ones around the edges, but they wouldn't break the law. So let me show you here. <clears throat> what you have is you have the laws of Moses here, 
as the foundation. This would be called the Torah. Or in Greek, it's called the Pentateuch. And so you have, that's the basis. That's the scriptures. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible, the laws were built. And those are the ones that God gave to Moses uh, to write down so that we are able to know what God expects out of people. What the Jews did is they come along and they add another layer to this, and it's called the Talma. Talmud. And in the Talmud, you have the Mishnah and you have the Jamara. Jamara. I think that's how you spell it. Um, G E M A R A. You know, nothing looks right when you, you ever, anybody else ever teach before? Nothing looks right when you can spell your own name on the board and it doesn't look right. <laughs> okay, so what you have is you have these laws that are oral laws. Oral laws that were written down called in the Mishnah. Those were put down into a text. And the, what it is is the rabbi would be, the rabbis of the day would be sitting there and saying, okay, this is what Moses says about the Sabbath. But I want to clarify it. So what they did is they put it in the Mishnah. Now the Mishnah, they would write that law down, but then they would still get confused. And so what they would do is the Jamara, they would they, they would find a written commentary. The, the, the Jamara is more of a commentary explaining what the Mishnah was supposed to say, part of the Talmud, in order to explain the law. Do you see that? Do you see how confusing it is? It's kind of like uh, today... You, you come to a church, and the church says, uh, God expects you to be holy. Well, that's true. Well, let me tell you how you can be holy. And so they say, well, you can't have open-toe shoes. Uh, women, you can't wear a dress without uh, having sleeves. Uh, women, if you cut your hair, you're in trouble. Uh, men, if you do this or you do that, you're in trouble too. And so the, we, the, the churches will build laws on top of the laws that's exactly what was happening back in this day. Not only do you have this, the Talma, but then you have another whole section on how to walk. And that is another section of the law uh, that's found there. It's, it's called the Halakha, uh, or however you want to pronounce it. Uh, it's actually the Hebrew word to, to walk. And so not only did you have to obey these laws, but then they would tell you, okay, this is how you apply them in your lives. So all these things are being built on each other. And so what's happening here in the text is Jesus is healing this man. He's showing his power that he has, and he's showing that healing on the Sabbath is not breaking the law of Moses, the original law. So that's what's happening in the text um, that we find in Matthew or in John chapter six or five, excuse me. Now, does everybody have that little sheet that says uh, parallels between John five and one through seventeen and nine one through thirty four? I want you to see there's a difference between these two parables or two stories that we find within the scriptures. And so what I did is I just did a quick summary from from, from one. I didn't make this up myself. Uh, But if you look at John chapter 5, this guy is not able to walk for 38 years. In John chapter 9, the blind man is blind from birth. So there's a difference. Uh, Jesus, uh, rather than the pool, is what heals him. Well, in a sense, Jesus healed the other guy, but Jesus used the pool of Simone. He used that to be able to bring healing to the blind man. And then you notice in John chapter 5, Jesus says something to him that's really unique. And really what he's doing is he's saying kind of like what the Pharisees were saying, that if you sin, then sickness will come into your life. But Jesus knew the heart of this man that's been there for 38 years. And he says, you know, you, you've been living a life of sin. 
Yeah, you can even live a life of sin as an invalid. He's living a life of sin, and Jesus says, uh, don't go on and keep on sinning again, or something worse is going to happen to you. But in John chapter 9, what he does is he's confronting the Pharisees and the scribes, and he's saying, this man didn't sin, but the reason this man was born blind is so that the glory of God could be shown. So there's a difference between the two. So when the Pharisees come along, and like people today, I even hear people say, the reason you got sick or the reason something bad happened in your life is because you're, you're a sinner. Well, let me tell you something. Anybody out there not a sinner? Anybody dare raise your, raise your hand? If, you, if somebody raises their hand and they're sitting next to you, move over because <laughs> lightning's going to strike any second. So all of us are sinners. And sometimes what happens is sickness comes because of the world that we live in. It happens. Uh, tragedy happens. I mean, look at Walter. Walter was in our class just a couple weeks ago. And all of a sudden, just like that, uh, he got sick. My wife and I were out hiking, uh, having a great time. All of a sudden, she falls over a 30-foot cliff. I mean, you know, you just never know what's going to happen in our lives. And what we got to do is keep it in perspective and say, what, ha what is this for? Uh, you know, in our, my wife's case, for instance, I, I look back now and I see that just the miraculous healing in her life uh, has caused many people to, to be challenged in their faith uh, and their walk with God. Um, neighbors, uh, people that she meets at the pools are doctors. Uh, many of these people are just amazed at the healing power of Almighty God. Now, some people have asked me, what happens if God wouldn't have healed her? That's a good question. I would have felt terrible. But I also know that God is merciful. He's gracious. He's a God that knows exactly what he's doing. And if he'd have taken my wife, that would be something that I would know that it was his will. Uh, for him to do that. Would I be sad? Yeah, after 51 years of being married to the same woman. Can you imagine trying to train another one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right, my wife's listening. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, she probably says the same thing about me. But, but think about it. You know, it, it, it's amazing what, what God does and how we have to trust him. You know, we need to trust him because he's a God that when things are bad, he's still there. When things are good, he's still there. He didn't leave just because things got bad in our lives. So this is what one of the lessons we learn in life. Is it an easy lesson? Can I sit back now and say after seven months, a little over seven months that my wife's been sick, um, that, I, that I think it was a piece of cake? No, it's still a day-by-day -day walk, trusting God, never know when the morning when she gets up if she's going to feel good or she's not. Um, you know, it, do, is that fair? Of course it's not fair. But at the same time, uh, to put my faith in a God that knows better than me is what I have to do. Now, do I struggle with that? Do I stand up here and say, in Look at me, I'm so proud that I'm, I'm strong in, in, with Christ. No, there are times I struggle. I ask God why, and I say, why are you doing this? Yeah, but at the same time, I've learned that my faith has been stretched um, to be able to understand that I serve an almighty God. So that's what I want you to understand. So John chapter 5 when he heals this person, uh, he, he's doing it to show his glory, to be able to, just like he did in chapter number nine. And so chapter five uh, doesn't tell us what feast um, it, we're, we're looking at, but it's a, one of the feasts at that particular time. Uh, somebody think it was a feast of Passover or Pentecost. Uh, we don't, we're not sure. But whatever, it's one of those times that he's healing, and he does it to this man who had no idea even who he was. Now, let's go on to the chapter 5. I just want to hit some highlights here. 
Um, the last part of chapter 5 really takes a shift. And what John is trying to do is he's trying to show, remember, he's trying to prove that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. So what he does in the last part of chapter 5 is he says, I want to show you, because John is more theological, he says, I want to show you how Jesus Christ is similar and actually does the same thing the Father does. And so what he does is he hits seven things, seven ways within the next couple verses, and I don't have time to go into all of them, but how is he similar? Uh, in verse number 19, look at verse 19. He says, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son does. So what he says is, what he's saying is, Jesus says, I am doing the same work as my father. Now, this whole Trinity thing is very confusing, but just to understand that, to show that Jesus is trying to show that he's the son of God, he said, Everything I do is in line with my Father in heaven. Then he says in verse 20, he says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show them even greater things than these. And so what he's talking about is the knowledge that God has. Jesus has the same knowledge. Verse number 21, he has the power to be able to raise the dead. I don't have time to read all these, these verses because we, we got a little later start today. But uh, just as the father raises the dead and, get, dead and gives them life, even so the son uh, gives life. And verse 22, uh, he's, he's similar in, in the, as the father when it comes to the authority to judge and then in verse number 23, uh, he's similar when it comes to the honor that is given to the father the son should have. Then in verse 24, in the power to give eternal life. In fact, I want to read that verse because he says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, that's, that's who sent Jesus, has eternal life and will not come into condemn, condemnation or be will not be condemned, there we go. Uh, he has crossed over from death to life. And so he tries to tell them that he has the same power to give eternal life. And then in verse 26, he says something that only John basically says. And it says, as for the, uh, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. In other words, he's able to be self-existent. So what he's trying to do in this chapter, as he ends out that healing, he's trying to show them that Jesus Christ and the Father are, well, let's see, how do I put it? Not, let me put it another way. My wife put it a good way at home. She says, what you, when you see Jesus, you see the Father. I think that's a much simpler way of putting it, don't you think? I think she came up with a really good uh, insight there. Uh, whenever we see what Jesus is doing, we can know that this is what the Father in heaven is doing. And so uh, it's a really beautiful example. Then in the last part of chapter 6, uh, there's really, he gives some of the testimony, or chapter 5 rather, uh, the testimonies about Jesus. Uh, we won't go into that, but I wanted to get into chapter 6 because chapter 6 is really a unique uh, passage of scripture. Uh, everybody knows the story of the feeding of the 5,000, right? It's when we tell children in, in Sunday school, we tell them, uh, we heard preachers preach on it. Did you know that the feeding of the 5,000 is the only part that's in all four of the gospels when it comes to the, to the healing, or to, to the healing, but to the feeding. So what you have, it's recorded in Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and Luke chapter 9. So what we have is we have the only miracle in all of the Gospels that's recorded, that's recorded rather, in all of the Gospels at that particular time. Pardon? Okay, Ma uh, Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and Luke chapter 9, and of course, John chapter 6. So it's the only 
miracle that's found in all uh, four of the, uh, the Gospels themselves. Now, this event takes place, and this is where I want you to pull out this little map. Everybody have this map? Or not a map, but a little picture that looks like a blue blob? It's not a blue blob. It's the Sea of Galilee. Okay? And what this is, is a unique... I, I had a hard time finding this particular picture. But if you look at this Sea of Galilee, it's kind of shaped like a harp. Uh, in fact, the Hebrew that's used for this word, uh, the name of the lake, is the Hebrew word for harp. Okay? Harp. Okay? So what I want you to see is here... These are, oh, I should have put them in. I put them in meters. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm used to races and, uh, you know, 10K, 5K. Um, I, I put the numbers in in meters. Okay. You, you could multiply by about three, and that, that will give you the right thing to the equivalent to our English depth. Yes. If God wanted us to use the metric system, we would only have 10 disciples. That's right. <laughs> I never thought about that. But if God wanted us to use the metric system, uh, he, we would only have 10 disciples. <laughs> You're right, Mark. That's very good. Uh, well, anyways. There were 10 commandments. Oh, yeah, the 10 commandments. There you go, the metric system. Old Testament, though. New Testament went to, to the English system. But if you look here, the Sea of Galilee, you see that 43, 43 times 3, uh, it's approximately 150 feet deep. So the deepest part of the lake is right over here on the, uh, on the east side. Uh, or let's, yeah, on the east side. So you have there, uh, when the disciples, when they went, in fact, let me draw this. It's going to be a lot easier if I draw it. Oh. We still need one of those boards that you can just pull up and it disappears. Yeah. Okay. So you got the Sea of Galilee. Let me just uh, take a picture here because I'm not the best artist in the world okay you got this thing going all the way down and then back up so oops oh it's wet it's still wet so it won't draw well anyways up here on the north end remember the Jordan River then fall, flows out of that and the part of the Jordan River from Mount Hermon comes in from the top side but the deepest part of the sea is right here where is Jesus during this time? They don't know where the feeding of the 5,000 is. It's either here, here, or here. <laughs> Did you know that? They're, 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 you read different commentaries, and they, they can't come up with where it really is. But the traditional spot of, of the, the, the feeding of the 5,000 would be right, well, actually, it's right about here. This is the traditional spot where they think it is. Now, when you look at the Sea of Galilee, if you would take a plane and fly over the top of it, you'll notice around the Sea of Galilee, it's green. Okay? What you have is you have mountains on all the different sides. On the east side, you have cliffs. On the uh, uh, east side... Uh, you have a bunch of the mountains too, but they're the higher mountains. So what you have is you have the cold, colder, dry air that comes down, sweeping down those mountains across the Sea of Galilee. If the wind comes off the Mediterranean, it comes down pa uh, past the cliffs and it causes the waves to increase at this particular time. So it's in this particular area that Jesus is, is working uh, the word, the Bethsaida, is probably where he's at. Bethsaida is right about here. It's not Bethesda. It's Bethesda, rather. Excuse me. Uh, Bethesda. Yeah, Bethesda. Uh, yeah, Bethesda is probably where he's at. 
But anyways, what's happening is the time of the year is probably about March and April that this event is taking place. And what's happening is, Jesus, look at the fact of this miracle. When Jesus looked up, verse number five, and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for all these people to eat? Now, they're not next to a city. It's not built up like it was back in, in, our, in our day if we went over to Israel. So what happens is they're on a kind of a remote hill. That's why they feel that this probably was a better spot uh, for it because this would be before the hills. And so they're in this area, and there's no near city. Capernaum's over here. Tiberias is down here. So you have different cities, but there's none really close. And so what's happening is he, Jesus says to, to, to Philip, one of the disciples, he says, where are we going to buy bread? But you notice in verse 6, he said they're only doing this to test them, to find out where their faith is, what he had in mind to do. And Philip says, huh, man, it's going to take eight months worth of salary to be able to feed all these people. And another disciple, Andrew, in verse number 8, Simon Peter's brother spoke up and he says, there's a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. Now think about this. We're not talking about a big loaf of bread, huge big loaf of bread. We're talking about barley that's made flat like a pancake, kind of like pita bread. And that bread is what this little boy has. So he's got five little tiny loaves of uh, 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 barley bread. By the way, barley, um, I don't know how many, of, how many of you ever eaten barley bread? Okay, there's a few of you. Yeah. It, what, what did you think of it? it kind of, it, it's really made, bread made for the people who are poor. Uh, that's what it was. It, it's gluten free, so it'd be right in with today's world. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's a gluten free bread at, at this particular time that he, he's, he's, he's feeding the people. But at the same time, it's not much. The fish were probably just small little pieces of sardine-type size. So think about it. There's 5,000 people there, but you notice that the text says there are 5,000 men. Now, for some of the new translations, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say whenever the word anthropos, or excuse me, the word man is used in the scripture, they said we need to translate it as brothers and sisters. You can't buy that argument with this verse. Because the word that's actually used in the Greek is only a word that's used for male men. And by the way, it's not a male man that delivers your mail. Uh, so, and with today's generation, we'd have a... You know, this is a harder text to teach today than it used to be. <laughs> but, but these were actually men. There were 5,000 of them there. Now, plus there were women and children. So if you add that up, there were probably ten to 15,000 people uh, that Jesus is going to have to feed with these five little tiny loaves of bread that this little boy brought and a couple fish. And what Jesus does is he does one of his miracles of feeding the 5,000. Now, you might ask, what significance is that? The significance is, is that in the Old Testament, Moses said in Deuteronomy, he said, after me is going to come one that's going to be like me. He's going to be a prophet. And what did Moses do in the wilderness? He fed the people with the manna, an oversized crowd of people with manna, and he was able to do it for 40 years. So what Jesus, what he's doing, and what John is picking up here in the text is he's trying to show us that this is the Messiah. Remember, every time he speaks in the book of John, he's trying to tell us Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. As Moses predicted that the Son of God would be like Moses, Jesus comes along and does exactly uh, like Moses did. And so he feeds the 5,000. And you notice what I la like about this. In verse number 10, he says, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass. Remember, there's grass all around the Sea of Galilee. And he says, there's plenty of grass. So they sat down. Jesus took the loaves, 
He prayed. Now, I, wanna, I have a question, but don't you dare raise your hand. How many of you pray before you eat? You know, I've watched more people in restaurants, and you go there, and everybody sits down, and it's a free-for-all. Who can eat first? You know, I think there's something, if Jesus Christ can give thanks, and he's the Son of God, you know, there, it's a witness when we bow our head, not stand on the table and say, hey, hallelujah, you know, all that kind of stuff. But when we pray, we're serving as a witness for Jesus Christ. So think about that. If you Don't be ashamed. Uh, you know, I've, had, I've gone up to people that I've seen praying with their family and their children at a restaurant, and I said, I'm so glad to see someone else is thankful for their food. To God. You know, encourage them. Encourage them. Well, anyways, Jesus gives thanks. He takes the bread and he starts to distribute it. He distributes the fish. But I want you to see that he says in verse number 11, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, distributed to them who were seated. Notice as much as they wanted. Jesus was generous. He, he says, you eat as much as you like. And some of these people that were coming to Jesus at this particular time were poor. They probably didn't have decent meals. And Jesus feeds every one of them to their full. I, 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 I just love that verse. But then he does something for the disciples in verse 13. He says, I want you disciples to grab a basket. And what I want you to do is go and gather up all the leftovers. Do you notice how many baskets they had? Twelve. How many disciples were there? Twelve. Can you imagine the wonder? I mean, remember, this, these are the days, these are the earlier days of Jesus. The disciples are still trying to make a decision of who Jesus Christ truly is. And so they're, they're, they're watching him. They're watching him turn water to wine. They're watching him heal somebody. They're watching him act like Moses. Can you imagine the faith, how their faith increased as they went around and they gathered all this extra food? I mean, even Judas had a basket. <laughs> he probably stored some of it away so he could make more money. But, uh, but anyways, it, it, think about it. Jesus Christ is, is increasing the disciples' faith in this very passage of Scripture. And what happens after they gather the, the baskets and they saw the miraculous sign, I want you to see that in verse number 15, after they, they said, oh, actually 14, it says, surely this is a prophet who has come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and to make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountainside. So what's happening is Jesus wasn't going to be forced into a bowl. He wasn't going to be sat back and he's going to say, you know, the people want me to be king. They want me to take over because the Roman government's so hard on them. And I'm going to help them out. I'm going to let them make me king. No, he knew when to withdraw because he knew his mission. What was it? It was the cross. So all along, you see these statements in the scripture where Jesus will wander off by himself uh, in, in this particular miracle. Okay, any questions on this? Everybody's read this before, right? Yes. When did the feeding of the 4,000 occur? Before or after? Probably after. Yeah, what was the feeding of the 4,000? Uh, probably after. He did, he did twice he did this miracle. A little bit different, a uh, different context. Uh, but yet both of them are, are the miracles of Jesus feeding, acting like Moses. He's, he's, he's the new Moses, you might say. Yeah, the better Moses. The book of Hebrews really uh, goes into quite a lot of detail about that. Okay, any other questions? How are we doing? Oh, yay. Um, well, I want to get to the next part. Verse 16 is really unique. Uh, the walking on the water, and the reason I have this depth map here, uh, this, this little map with all the, 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 how deep it is, if you think about it, 
Where is the deepest part of the, of the Sea of Galilee? It's up in the north. Remember, Jesus' early ministry was all around the Sea of Galilee, up on the north end mainly. This is the time when he's being, uh, people are sitting there and saying, wow, look at who he is. He's the son of God. Ah, man, and they, they, they try to make him king by force. They, they, they love him. They, they follow him, and they're obeying him, and they're thinking he's the greatest thing since apple pie. And so they have all these things happening. But if you notice on that north end is where the deep water is. And so what's going to happen is if you go out into the lake with a boat, remember, these are rowboats. They're not, uh, you know... 500 horsepower uh, speed drag boats, but they're they're little. They're not so big. Some of these boats that they were talking about here, and they get into this boat and they're going to take it at night because Jesus says, in fact, in verse 16, it says, "When evening came, the disciples went down to the lake. When they got into the boat, they set off across the lake to Capernaum." So what they're doing is they're basically going from wherever they are over in this area to a place called Capernaum, which is about here at the top part uh, of the Sea of Galilee. So they're going to be traveling at night. The storm comes up. The waves are probably 20 feet. And what happens is Jesus comes out there and he's walking on the water and they get scared. And Jesus says to them, here's another ego a me, I am. He says, He says, it is I, don't be afraid. In the Greek, it's literally ego a me, another one of those. But we don't classify it when we classify the seven ego a me's. Uh, I am, I, I, I am. And and they they are willing to take them into the boat. And immediately, the, the, the waves stopped. And Jesus has them on shore. There's a miracle that's, that's taking place that, that's just, Really, really great. I, I want you to see something. Um, I got it in my notes someplace. Uh, let me see. I don't know if I have it. You know, I wonder if I can get a picture of this made. I don't know how many of you can see this, but maybe I can. Um, this is an aerial view of the Sea of Galilee. And if you notice all around here, it's all green. It's all green because of the water that's there. Here's the mountains. That, yeah, and you, you have a map. You have a map there, too, that big one. Hold that up in the air so people can see it. Look at that map. But on the east side, there are cliffs like this. You see that? Can everybody see that cliff? Okay. So what you have, this is, by the way, uh, Arbel is a, a mountain cliff that is a park over in Israel area, in Jerusalem area, or not Jerusalem, but up in the Sea of Galilee area. It's a park where you actually enter into and you hike. So Arthur, you would love that. It's a hiking park. You hike to the top of this uh, high mountain uh, at that particular time. So what happens is that's where the wind, if you, in fact, I think I'm going to make this. I'll make you a copy of this. I'll somehow get these two maps incorporated. But this map right here, I wish you could see it. But if you see how high the cliff is, and if you look down in here, you see the valley. So what happens when those winds come flying down there uh, to the Sea of Galilee, what happens is the waves start to get really big. And so what Jesus does is he's trying, remember again, he's trying to train his disciples on trusting in him at that particular time. So... Anyways, that's, uh, oh, I know what I forgot to do. Everybody have this page here? It says parallels between John 5 and 9, but then down at the bottom it says parallels between John 6 and Numbers 11. Everybody have that? You know, what, what I found kind of curious, curious is if you look at, Numbers chapter 11. Some of you say, well, what happened in Numbers chapter 11? Numbers of chapter 11 is when G- uh, Moses is feeding the people the manna. And when he's feeding the people the manna, what happens as he's doing that, these are some of the act- reactions. In, in the book of Numbers, 
hey, where do we get, where do we get the bread? In John chapter 6, where do we get the bread? Uh, a disproportional amount of, uh, amount of people with the amount of food that was available. Uh, it's found in both of them. The description of the manna. But then you notice the people are grumbling in both of them. <laughs> both of them. So every, even though Jesus feeds them and he does all these things, the people are still just grumbling away like crazy and uh, they don't appreciate all that he has done. So anyways, that's that passage of scripture. Uh, there's one other verse I want to go over. I, remember, we can't do everything in these passages. I wish we could. But I want you to see a very unique verse. Um, if you look at John chapter 6, and let me erase this because this is kind of cool. This is just an add-on that you could have. No, no extra charge for this one. Would you turn to John chapter 6, verse number 66? Does anybody recognize the number 666? Oh, wow. <laughs> what I want you to see is <laughs> the reason you can remember this verse because now what's happening in John's gospel is the people are starting to turn on him. Jesus has done all these miracles. John doesn't record all of them. But remember, Jesus becomes very popular. Then when Jesus starts to ask for commitment, the people start turning on him. And so what's happening is John's chapter 6, verse number 66, is really one of those verses. In fact, I like to call it one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Because what's happening here is, it says that they walked with him no longer. After Jesus had done all these things, from that time on, many of the disciples turned back. Now, the word disciple there is the word mathetes. Um, it doesn't mean the apostles, necessarily. It's just uh, the word mathetes in the, in the scriptures, in the Greek, rather, is a word that means a follower of Jesus. So, these followers of Jesus, they turned back and no longer wanted to follow him. But I want you to note in verse 67, Jesus says to his disciples, do you want to leave too? And here's that one of the great confessions of Peter. Peter says, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One from God. And so you have a the contrast of what's going to happen now in the next few chapters. You have people that are going to follow Jesus and people that are going to reject him. And that's the same thing that happens today. Isn't that wild? So if you want to remember one verse in the Bible and you want to remember the mark of the beast, just remember John 666 is one of the saddest verses found in all the word of God. Any questions on that? Yes. It goes on to talk about him um, pointing out that one of them was the devil. Did, did oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't read the next verse. Did he identify him? Yeah, he didn't identify him. She, she's talking about the next verse that I didn't read. Sorry. Um, okay, look at, well, I'll read it. Verse 70. And Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He's talking about Judas Iscariot. Uh, he meant, yeah, in fact, it even says that. He meant Judas, the son of uh, Simon Iscariot, the one of the 12 who would later betray him. Did he identify him at that time? Yes, he did. Well, he identified him in the scripture. John, Remember, John's gospel is writing after later. It's one of the later gospels. So John assumes that you already know Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now he's going back and he's showing how this all fits together. I guess I'm asking, did he confront him? No. Oh, okay. Jesus didn't confront him. Yes, Tracy. Well, I think the reason that they did not want to follow him is because when he said he was the bread of life and you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, yes. that really turned a lot of people off. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that really did. And, and, and we, we get into that uh, within that text itself. You know, eat my bread and drink, drink my blood. We're not talking about cannibalism. 
Uh, we're talking about, uh, see, the people were thinking physically. And John is, remember, John's theological in his gospel. He's, he's thinking spiritually. So Jesus is not saying you've got to literally take a bite out of, bite out of his leg uh, or his arm. He's saying you've got to understand that you take me in. You take my life and you apply that to your life. And that's what it means. Does anybody else have any comments? Yes, Jody. Yeah, the, okay, she's asking about the manna in the, and when Moses gave it. Yes, they, Moses prayed to God uh, because he was in a dilemma. These people are hungry, and uh, God is the one who provides. It's, it, it, but the, they always say that it was the, the bread that came from heaven. That's how it's stated. That isn't the same thing when Jesus feeds the 5,000. Didn't that bread come from God? Yeah, that bread came from God too because he, he's the one that reproduced it. He's the bread of Adam. Yeah, he's the bread, bread of life, the bread of heaven. So, yes. He is the word unless. So he's saying there's only one way. That's right. And that's probably one of the reasons why they turned away from it. Yeah, yeah and, and like our pastor has been saying lately, uh, there's only one way. You know, we're going to get to that in John 14, where it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So we serve a very, inclusive, or very exclusive religion, you might say, uh, that Jesus says, there's no other way but me. Wow. Boy, that sure is a mess in today's world, isn't it? Yes, Chuck. There were only two miracles performed in Jerusalem. That's the two pools. None of the the others were performed. The 47 miracles were performed other places besides uh, besides Jerusalem. And and you you might wonder why why are only a few miracles formed in Jerusalem? Because the Pharisees were out to kill him as he entered. We're going to see that in the next chapter. Even his brothers say to him, aren't you going to go? And I'll explain that because there, there are three special holidays or festivals, and I'll, I'll explain that next week, uh, how these festivals fit into a Jewish man's life. And uh, when Jesus gets down to Jerusalem, he's on his last, his days are numbered. He, he's, he's, he's now headed to the cross fully, and that's it. Okay, any other questions? Yes. I had a comment on um, John chapter 5 when you were talking about the laws where you weren't allowed to carry your bed, but you weren't allowed to walk around with your stuff, that that was work. Yes. Um, they, there's a word called eruv. I don't know whether I'm saying that right. Okay. Eruv, Jewish word. Yeah. Roof. Yeah. So they would extend the roof so that they could walk further. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. They have a place where they can walk for yeah, so they far. Have a huge area so they can contract all their business and do their daily yeah. activities. Yeah. Yeah, because you can only walk so many steps. You can only walk so many steps on the Sabbath. And remember, all that comes from the Talmud. Talmud. The Talmud. Remember, I was reading to you where the Sabbath laws come in. Remember, I was showing you how you can only take out two stitches. Uh, before you break the law, you can only sew, sew on or sew one stitch or something like that. And then one of the very last ones, remember it always says in there, it says, because uh, it's on my computer, I should, well, I could make a copy of it sometime. But anyways, on the computer, it lists all these different laws that you, 30, 39, it says 40 minus one. So they list they list all these different laws, and the very last one down at the very bottom of the paragraph, guess what it is? You can't pick something up and carry it. Like your cross. Yeah. Before the time of Moses, Abraham circumcised on the Sabbath. Correct. Okay, so could you explain that? Well, that's because he wasn't breaking the law. 
Uh, there, yeah, and he, Abraham, when, when the circumcision was done on the Sabbath, it's still done that way. Um, they don't believe they're breaking the Sabbath. The same thing what people used to say to me as a preacher. You preach every Sunday and you tell us we can't work on the Sabbath, uh, our Sunday Sabbath. And, and I'd say, yeah, but there's even the priest worked on the Sabbath. Uh, there's an exception to the rule for doing the work of God on that particular day. Now, we've got that carried away. Uh, my wife was raised a lot different than me. I don't know how she ever got married to me. But, uh, <laughs> you, you know, she couldn't use scissors on Sunday. Oh, wow. They weren't allowed to. They had to stay in their dress clothes. And they couldn't use scissors. Couldn't use the sewing machine. Couldn't, yeah, they couldn't do a lot of things on, on the Sabbath. So those laws that are, seem so crazy, uh, even in today's world, are still being carried on sometimes. I thought of this for some time. We used to circumcise babies right in the delivery room, and sometimes they bleed, bleed a lot. I mean, really, really bleed a lot, need stitches and things like that. Can you speak up? Uh, yeah. This, this is interesting. Here's a doctor who used to work with babies all the time, delivered them. We used to circumcise babies on, on the delivery table right away. And sometimes they'd bleed like heck and need stitches. And I even remember one time having to call a urologist because they couldn't get it to stop. Wow. So now in most hospitals, they won't circumcise them until eight, eight, eight. maybe. What, because there's, there's not much prothrombin or vitamin K. The, they give shots of vitamin K now, but pr prothrombin isn't, isn't, there isn't enough of it to keep babies from bleeding. Yeah, and that, isn't it funny the scriptures talk about on the eighth day they would circumcise a child? I wonder how they figured that out before they had doctors like you. <laughs> uh, if you compare vit the vitamin K, the shot, and the proskin, whatever that word is. <laughs> anyway, vitamin K maxes out at seven days. Prothecan maxes out at eight days. So that's why they usually do the circumcision on the eighth day. Yeah. Isn't it, you know, it just... What, what I get a kick out of is how the scriptures, before all the modern technology and all the things that we have, is so accurately correct. I mean, how did they know except the hand of God, the creator that created us, says, you circumcise a child on the eighth day? I mean, they would have never known that. And yet, God protected his people and said, you circumcise him on the eighth day because that, the baby won't bleed like he would another day. Wow. Not one day early, not one day late, but the eighth day. Am I out of time? I think I, oh my, oh my goodness. I'm, okay, what I want you to do for next week, I want you to start reading chapter number seven. And uh, what we're going to do is talk about the Feast of Tabernacle, but we're also going to add in some of the other feasts. And we'll be able to go a little bit faster, but in chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10, we're going to see the opposition to Jesus taking place at a very intense level. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to put together those chapters and show you uh, how they fit together and how the intensity of the hatred towards Jesus by the religious leaders uh, was becoming so strong in those next chapters. And we're not going to spend, we, I wish we had time to, to go into more detail, but I really, I do need to get through the New Testament sooner or later. So, uh, <laughs> so we're going to try to get, get this survey moving, and I hope this is helpful. But I just want you to get a taste for the Word of God and uh, to be able to approach it and be able to say, oh, I understand it a little bit better because of the culture. So any questions? If not, we're going to close in a word of prayer. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it because it's getting to be close to summer now. And uh, I appreciate you still sticking with this class uh, during this time. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you so much for just the many things that we find within the pages of Scripture. We thank you for a man like John that trusted you, that uh, wrote these things down so that we might be able to see that Jesus Christ 
that you truly are the Son of God and that by our faith in you, we can have eternal life. Not because we deserve it, but because you give it freely. And Father, we thank you so much for that. We thank you for your love for us when we uh, let you down so often. But Father, we thank you that your love never gives up on us. And Father, I pray that you would help us to appreciate that more and more each day. For I pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Yes, Wendy? Wendy? Can we get a microphone over to her? Because she's got this little tiny voice out of a little tiny woman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Come on. Okay, I am, I just want to thank you, Dave, and for all of us. And I've been here since day one, and it's just truly amazing how all of these people have come to know you and love you. Oh, and thank you. I don't think we thank you enough and Arlene oh. enough for all that you've done for all of us. Well, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I don't know how many of you know it, but Wendy's husband uh, was the one who kept asking me to teach a class, and I kept putting it off. I said, I'm retired. I just retired. Just retired. <laughs> I pastored for 44 years. Give me a break. And he kept at me and kept at me. And uh, we started out with about 20 people, and I I'm amazed. Uh, bring a friend. You know, you're going to learn the Word of God uh, as we go through this. Uh, at least I hope you're learning the Word of God as we study the Scriptures together. So thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate you as much as I think you appreciate me. Thanks. Yeah, and if we could get some of you guys to help pick up the tables and all that, uh, that would be great. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. No, I'm going to make copies. I'll make copies right now. Is Lisa here? Lisa, can you make a copy?